Right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Nate Carnes, as most of you now know, uh, Associate Director here of the Center of Teaching Excellence, and I have the honor and pleasure of introducing one of my colleagues in the Department of Instruction and Teacher Education in the face of Dr. Catherine Compton Lilly, who is the uh, John C. Uh, Hunger Pillar Professor. It's an endowed uh, professorship in the Department of Instruction Teacher Education. She teaches courses in literacy studies and works with local educators as well as help out our elementary program and other people like me in middle level program. Her past research followed by her followed eight of her former uh, first grade students through high school. So she has done a lot of uh, longitudinal study experiences of uh, children from immigrant families. She has authored several books and many articles in major education literacy uh, journals. Her interests include helping readers and writers of all ages uh, find joy as they engage in all forms of text, including doctoral students whom she was just working with and as I think she's caught her breath now and is now with us. If there's anything else she wants to share about herself, she would like to. Beautiful. Glad thank you, Nate. Thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. I know that you know our lives are crazy, and, and getting to these these events is often really hard, and we all feel like we should be doing more of them, but it's often really tricky. So thank you for being here today. I would love to know who you folks are. So Frank, would you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Frank Robinson. Uh, I work with teachers and principals. Uh, Mm -hmm. Are you uh, in the School of Education or so? Keep me busy. Good. Perfect. I'm Jacob Rivers and I teach uh, English for the Extended University in the evenings. Beautiful. Very nice. Hi, I'm Melissa Otero. I'm a first year master's student in geography. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, geography. Yeah. Very good. Hi, I'm Gavin I'm a first year master's student in anthropology. Wow. Oh, well, so, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to ask you, so you're interested in teaching adults at some point in your... Yeah, and actually I have to lead, like, uh, you have to do as well, but I lead recitation sections, yeah. and then, yeah, so my students have to part. We need yes. some stuff that even for me is quite high level, so... Yes, good. No, I know the, I know the feeling. Even as, doc as, as professors, we're like, okay, you got to get my head around this and be coherent. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, I'm Andrew Zader. I work... I work at the data lab at the business school. I'm an MBA first year, okay. and um, a lot of not a lot of reading in there, but a lot of interpreting, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of resources that can help them. Lovely. Hi everyone. My name is Michelle Bell, and I'm a third year English teacher at the School of Medicine, and I'm also a teacher assistant with the biology. Beautiful. Beautiful. So you have lots of readings and things for them to do. Yeah. yeah. Teresa, yes, I'm Teresa Harrison, I'm the project manager for the Carolina Family Engagement Center in the College of Education, but I'm also a second year doctoral student in Educational Leadership and Analysis. Beautiful. So nice to meet you. My name is Adam Shemri, graduate student in Omerai. Oh, nice. I'm Five years ago, I worked in the School of Fair Promotion and Development in Teresa. And Dr. Moon, <laughs> yeah. will you introduce yourself? <laughs> sure. My name is Yi Lu. I'm a visiting scholar from China, and I'm working with me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. So, the face my advisor. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very glad. glad to be here. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're going to talk about helping students read college level texts. And one of the things I want to argue is that we're all still learning to read. So, even though here we are in graduate school and at a major university, we're all still learning to read because reading is so um, contingent on what you're reading. So, for example, many of you, I, I, I'm, okay, I, I've had my doctorate for a while, I've been teaching university courses, I was teaching most recently at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, so I, I did a lot of work with, that, uh, with graduate students, reading very high theoretical kinds of papers and those sorts of things. However, if you give me a medical journal, or if you gave me a, um, a piece in from a law journal, I wouldn't be able to read that very well. 
And that's kind of the premise I come into this conversation today is, is that being a good reader, being able to read, is contingent on what you're reading. And that all of us are very good at reading some things, but not so good at reading other things. One of the pieces of research that I did when I was at UW-Madison was we had students who were middle school students. They were boys in middle school. And when we tested them on the reading assessments that you use in school, they would test at grade four or five. But when you looked at what they were reading around the video games, World of Warcraft that they loved, they could read college level texts, understand those texts, and use those texts to increase their level on the game and to win without any problem whatsoever. So reading is really contingent on your background knowledge, what you know, the vocabulary, the schemas, all of those sorts of things have a lot to do with how well you read things. And when our kiddos come to, grad, to undergraduate or graduate education, um, they're confronting texts that are like no other texts that they've had to, had to read in the past, or that they very rarely had to read. Or if they did have to read them, they had a lot of support in doing that. So now we're asking them to read at a much higher level and to be able to do things with that information that might not be something they're useful. So I'm arguing that we're all still learning to read. And I'm arguing that we're also confronting new genres that require new strategies. So they need new ways to go at text, things that they haven't practiced too often. They're also required, and I'm also gonna argue that reading requires more than deciphering the words on the page. So if you gave me that medical journal, I'd probably be able to say most of the words out loud but I'm not sure I would understand what I'm reading about, right? Because reading is not just being able to spit the words out and being able to say the words. It's about understanding those words and understanding the relationships between those words and other words and understanding the particular meaning that that word is carrying in that particular genre or in that particular discipline, which might be different than the meanings the words carry in other spaces, right? So all of these things play into how we read. So, read me the first sentence. She read the book. <clears throat> she read the book. Next sentence. She won't read the book. What'd you do? Change the tense. Say it again? Change the tense. Yeah, you change the tense and you change your pronunciation of that word, right? Even though the words are identical. It's read or read, but depending on the context in which it's operating, you read it differently. Now this is a really easy example, which doesn't require a lot of disciplinary knowledge. But the same thing is going on when people are reading. And sometimes it's the pronunciation that shifted, sometimes it's nuances of meaning that shift. So a word that's very generic and part of our vernacular vocabulary can have a very different meaning when you use it in geography or sociology or medicine. Those words can have nuances of meaning, and that's what sometimes our students are having trouble with. Let's look at another example. Go ahead and read this. <coughs> 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 what just happened? This <laughs> 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 We got you, right? Okay, so again, we have a word that can be said and pronounced two different ways and has two very different meanings, right? But when you knew it was smelly and ugly, you thought sewer. Right? And it wasn't until we got to the end of the sentence you had to go, oh, wait a minute. Um, you know, a sewer can't make clothing. So, but, but here again, I'm playing with the idea that it's not just decoding. It's not just being able to sound out the words, or it's not just being able to identify the word. Is that words have, have dimensions of meaning, and that those dimensions of meaning are, are discipline specific. Go ahead and read this out loud. According to our research Okay, so remember what I was saying before that it's not, not just sounding out the words, right? If you had to rely on sounding out words or putting letter sounds into sequence, you would not have been able to read this. So something else is going on in your brain too. 
So not only do we have words that have different pronunciations and different meanings can, in, depending on context, but also your brain is doing something that goes beyond a letter-by-letter -letter reading of words on the page. And I'm going to show you a little bit of reading theory that's going to help you get a sense of how your brain is working with text. Okay. So I'm going to make this argument here. I'm going to argue that when you're reading, sometimes you are using the visual information. And visual information is the letters and sounds. So I'm arguing that phonics is important. Knowing the letters and the sounds they make is a piece of the reading puzzle, and that it's very important. And that our students, when they're reading, are sometimes coming to words they may never have seen before, and they may be doing a left to right decoding, they may be sounding out those letters and putting them together. But that's not the only thing that's going on. There's also meaning going on. So think about yourself when you're reading. Think about yourself when you're reading and you get tired. Okay? So you've read those two pages, and then you stop and you think, I have no idea what I just read. Right? Happens every once in a while? Okay. So this is because you're not keeping meaning in your mind as you're reading. You may be looking at each word and decoding each word, but you're not thinking about what those words mean and how they go together into sentences and how the sentences go together into arguments and how all those things are put together. And that's often how our students and undergraduate, our undergraduate students read. They say, kind of look at every word and decode every word, but they're not putting the ideas together and the meanings together. And why this is important is, as I was saying, we're going to use phonics, we're going to use the visual information on the page to read. But we're also going to use meaning. Because when we read along and it doesn't make sense, or when we read along and we don't remember what we just read, we're going to go back and read it again. And this is something that's going to come up during this presentation. It's the idea that you need to monitor your reading. You need to be paying attention to the meaning that you're making as you're reading. And you need to use that as kind of a gauge to know whether I need to go back and read it again, whether I can keep reading, whether I need to flip back two pages and see what he was talking about. So you're using that meaning to negotiate your meaning making of the, of, the, of the story, to monitor and to adjust as needed to what's going on in the book. And we're really good at this when we're reading easy text. When we're, we're reading easy text, we just kind of fly through it, and um, we don't have to do as much monitoring. But when we get to tough stuff, when you're reading something that's in your zone of proximal development, where you really have to think about it, that's when there starts to be some slip or something for our students and for us. So we've got the visual information, the letters and sounds on the page. We've got meaning and monitoring for meaning and making sure that we're putting the ideas together that are presented in the story. But we also have syntax. Syntax is the idea that when you're reading along, you can predict the next word because of, of the structure of the language. So in our language, we often have noun, verb, noun. Right? Those, that's the basic structure of English. Not all languages are structured that way. So if you, your first language is something else, you often have trouble figuring out the structures of English, right? It takes a little bit of a of some work. But the structures of English help us to be able to um, kind of predict what's going to come next, the type of word that's coming next. So this has to do with grammar and the way words flow together. So if I said, um, I was tired, so I went to, you might say bed, you might say sleep. They're both nouns, but you knew it was going to be a noun because you knew the kind of sentence I had set you up to be, right? There could have been variations. I was tired, so I went to um, get my pillow, right? You could, but but you, you have a sense of what might happen next because of the syntactical structure of that sentence, and kids use that when they read. Hi, Kenneth. We, we introduced ourselves before you got here. Would you like to tell people who you are? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I guess real quickly. Um, Kenneth. I'm going to go by Kenny. I'm a TA for uh, anatomy and physiology course here, and you know it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of information, so I feel like this works out with Good. Welcome. Thank you. So when all of these things are working together, this is where we have comprehension. Okay. So the argument I'm trying to make is we need to draw on visual information, we need to draw on meaning, and we need to draw on syntax. When all those things are orchestrated or working together in Junction, then we've got good reading going on. And this is what we want to establish for our students. I'm going to give you some clues, I hope, that will help us to do it. Okay, so here's a sentence. They blank across the grass. What can go in that 
slot. Verb. Yeah, verb. Lots of verbs, right? So give me some verbs that could fit in there. Ran. Crawled. Crawled. Skipped. Slithered. Hopped. Right? But you're right. Jacob is exactly right. It's always a verb. Okay? And Jacob knew that because he knows English. He knows the syntactical structures of English, and he knew it had to be a verb in order for it to sound right in English, right? So kids are, this is one of the cueing systems that they use when they read, and adults as well, is we're kind of predicting what comes next based on the structures of the sentences that we're reading. Now I'm going to give you another clue. John let his pet rabbit go. It blanked across the grass. Hopped. Anything else? Scurry. Scurry. It popped. <laughs> Jumped maybe, right? But we've taken out some of the options. Right? We've now narrowed it down to rabbits. And now we're using meaning because we know what a rabbit is. Okay? And if we know what a rabbit is, our prior expectations and knowledge about rabbits is going to narrow the kinds of verbs that we put into that space. Now if I do this, what is it? Popped, right? So now you see the H, so you know phonetically it can't be scurried anymore. We've now narrowed it down to pop. And this is what kids are doing when they're reading. They're using meaning, syntax, and visual information to narrow down choices and to figure out what the words are that come next. And we all do this as readers. Some of us do it at higher levels, some of us do it at lower levels. When kids are first starting to read, we try and help them to coordinate those different systems so they become capable readers. So, this is what we call orchestration, helping us, helping kids integrate all the different information that they can use to help them to decode text. And I'm arguing today that we need to do this for college students as well, because um, they certainly can read. Most of our students are very good readers, but we also want to help them to be able to read different kinds of texts than they've encountered in the past, and to read more difficult texts than they've encountered in the past. So I'm going to talk today about things that we can do before we assign readings, while they're actually reading, and after they've read something. So those are three ways that we can scaffold or support them, is by doing activities before, during, and after reading. So here's our agenda for today. I'm going to talk to you about four strategies that I use with my undergrads and my graduate students. One is preparing and previewing the things that we give them to read. Another is doing a close reading, and you're actually going to do a close reading with us here today. We're going to do a little bit of a genre study and think about the different genres that we encounter in our various courses and what the demands are of those genres. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about thought papers, which is a way to give kids, give kids. I, I'm, I'm used to teaching kids, so I often slip into children language, to get young adults to um, express what they learn from the papers and to participate in a conversation around those papers in writing. Okay, so preparing and previewing. I'm going to give you something to read, and I want you to read it, and then when you're done, I'm going to ask you how confident you are of what you just read how well you understand it. So if you really understood everything in there, you're going to show me 10 fingers. If you only understood a little bit, you might give one, two, or three fingers. Okay? So go ahead and read this. You can read it inside your head if you want, or aloud, whatever's better for you. And then I'm going to ask you for where you fall. you did. Are there any words you need me to uh, decode for you? Are there any words you couldn't read? Are there any words that you don't know the meaning for, that you need me to give you a definition for? Okay, so you could read all the words, and you understood all the words, right? Okay, so give me 10 means you understood everything and you can explain it to the group. 
One means you have no idea what you're making about. Show me how many fingers. Okay, we've got an eight, a four, and a one, and a one. And a, <laughs> a shaky five. Uh huh, uh huh. Okay, okay. Who thinks they know? Where's my 10? Is there a 10? Where's my 8? Do you want to give it a go? Well, the first sentence is talk about the procedure where you just arrange things and one model might be sufficient. The entire middle is just talking about how it can be complicated. And I think it kind of overdoes a lot of the sentences kind of overlap and don't really flow. And then at the end, it goes back to arranging things in groups and just make sure you do it right and repeat it if you need to. So I think the thesis is they're just telling you how to arrange things. Things might get difficult. Then at the end, make sure you do it well. This is a brilliant example. You just explained everything that's going on in here. But what are you doing? Arranging something. Something. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what. Oh. Yeah. And that's why you didn't have ten fingers up. Anyone think you know what you're doing here? <laughs> Go back and take a look. See if I'm right. Put it into. Tiles, a mistake is expensive, it's a facet of life. Okay? So this is doing laundry, but you didn't recognize it because there's no code words in there. There's no detergent, there's no clothes, there's no washing machine. All of the things that would have triggered laundry are missing. And they did that on purpose because they used this to play with people's heads, right? Okay. So but but my point is if you're handing students things to read and you're not giving them a sense of what that thing is about, then the chance that they're going to understand it is increased. They're, they're going to have a harder time with that text than if you gave them a few basic ideas of what they're going to read about. Does that make sense? So what we want to do is, I was saying, what do you do before you, you give them the text? Is you want to set them up and say, this is a uh, reading I'm going to have you read. And I want you to read it because of this, this, and this. And in this text, you will find that there's some sections that are very simple, but there's a complicated part on page 15. And when you read that section, you might want to take some notes or draw a diagram. And you might want to say, you know, one of the things you have to understand in order to understand this paper is that blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. And those blah, blahs are specific to the paper that you're going to have to read and specific to the discipline in which you're working on. So what I'm actually suggesting is, is that before you give kids something to read, you're going to actually tell them a little bit of what it's about. So at the end of class, before I send the students off, and they've got, you know, their homework outlined in the syllabus, and, you know, they know what chapters to read, before I send them out, I will pick one or two of the articles, and I might spend five minutes talking about it. So in this particular set of articles, this first piece by Marie Clay is particularly complicated. It's a high-level assessment piece that teaches teachers how to assess young children's reading and writing. And it's a little bit tricky to read. It's not written in nice, easy, straightforward English. It's got a lot of instructions on what you should do. It's got a lot of theoretical um, ideas embedded in it. So it's a rather tough piece to read. So when I introduce this one, I might have a couple PowerPoint slides that show them some of the information in there. I might send them to page three and have them just read that first paragraph and then talk to a partner about what they're going to read about. I might identify a little outline of some of the things in that paper. What I do related to it is contingent on what particular demands are of that paper. But I'm going to spend a little bit of time, especially with the tough readings, to set them up. So that when they start to read, they've got a little bit of something to cling on to. If you had known you were reading about laundry, you would have understood that. Right? So now we're going to tell them what they're reading about before they start reading. You're not going to tell them everything in the paper. Then why read it, right? But you're going to give them enough so that they can hook on to things to help them to read. Any questions like that? Is making sense? Yeah. So at the end of class, before you know they go off to read their assigned reading, I usually hold up. I might hold up. You know, I, I love hard copies for myself personally, so I have the hard copies of these too. And I might hold them up and say, "In this paper, you're going to read about blah blah blah." One sentence. This paper, blah blah blah. But in this one, you really want to pay attention too. And then, like I said, it might be PowerPoint slides. It might be a little bit of summary. It might be an outline. 
but it's something that's going to help them so when they jump in, they have something to stand on, a little bit of a foundation. So as I said, this is the reading that I would have chosen from that list. It's an advanced text. It assumes that they have prior knowledge about literacy assessment, and not all of the students do because it's the first literacy assessment course that they take. It has a heavy theoretical load. It also has a heavy practical load. But my kiddos haven't been teachers yet. So they're, they're, their practical knowledge isn't all that deep either. So I have to help them with that. And it's long. It's 30 pages. And one of the things we know about undergrads is that with short bits of text, they have stamina. But when you get to the 10th page and the 12th page and the 20th page, they're getting tired. Right? So stamina is an important thing to think about. So those longer pieces, you may need to do a little bit more scaffolding with, and that'll help them to be able to process it. One of the things I find is that if I set them up and, and uh, uh, prepare them for their readings, they're more likely to do it. And when they do it, they're more likely to understand more than they do. Because if they just go cold, it's like reading the laundry. They can say all the words, and they can define all the words, but they don't always know what they're reading about. So I might also ask them some questions when I send them off with that reading. I might say, what is Dr. Clay saying? What's her argument? Um, why is this crucial for students' futures? How does this translate into practice? What might be difficult to understand? And what language differences are operating in this text? So I'm thinking about these questions, but I'm also trying to get them to think about these questions. Why are you reading this? Why do you need to know about literacy assessment? Pushing them to have a purpose for reading, because if they don't have a purpose, they're not going to invest as much in that effort. How does it translate into practice? Why do you need this? Again, that gets back to purpose. What might be difficult to understand? I need to think about that carefully, because pages one, two, three, four, five might be pretty straightforward. But on page six, seven, and eight, it gets into some heavy stuff and some background knowledge they might have. So I'm going to do a little analysis of that text before I send them off to read. And are there language differences? This text actually is written by a woman in New Zealand. And New Zealand English and American English are very similar, but every once in a while, <laughs> they use a word in a slightly different way. So they talk about kids in different levels instead of different grades. Okay? And sometimes that throws the students off because they just don't understand their verbiage. They talk about tutors instead of um, substitute teachers. So there's some weird things that are just translated differently. So now let's actually do some. We're going to do some close reading. Okay? And close reading is a strategy for um, helping students to actually engage with the text that's in front of them. And again, for close reading, I often um, choose texts that uh, are just a little bit tricky. So I brought a text here for you from our education field. It's not terribly, I, I wasn't too hard on you. I could have been a lot worse. But I'm going to give you a text that's a little bit tricky. And I'm going to ask you to read it. And this is a strategy for helping children, helping children, helping students while they're reading. So before we were talking about what to do before we send something home, this is what we can do while they're reading. And this is an activity that I often use with texts that I want them to read in class. Sometimes they're texts that they read the day before and that were due today. Sometimes they're texts that I'm going to assign them and they're going to take home with them. But as you can see, we're only doing two paragraphs. So I'm picking a particularly challenging text with some heavy material, often theoretical, and it's something that I really want them to understand. So I can only do this with you know, a couple paragraphs during any given class session. So I'm going to choose the text that I really think are crucial for them to be able to make sense of. And sometimes knowing these two paragraphs in a larger piece will help them understand the whole piece, right? So often there's a theoretical section or a, a critical section to understand. So here's what I want you to do. You're going to read this text. And as you read, anytime you have a thought, you're going to draw a line from where you were in the text to the margin, and you're going to write down your thought. Now your thought might be, oh, this makes sense. I got it. Your thought might be, I don't understand this part. It might be, this word, I don't understand what they mean by this. It might be, um, oh, I see. Maybe this relates to this and this. So whatever you're thinking as you read, you're going to write it down. And your emphasis is going to be on making sense of these two paragraphs. 
So every single person in this room, I want you to annotate at least three different spots in this text. And then when we're done, I'm going to ask you to share your annotations as we read through the text. Because what we're doing here is instead of making this text, reading this text your problem, now it's going to be a collective effort. And if we get this really critical part of the reading done as a group, it's going to help me to read the text tomorrow. Or it's going to help me to process what I read the night before. Does that make sense? No. So I'm going to give you this text. You're going to read it. I want you to annotate at least three places in the text where you had a thought. Okay, Andrew, carry on. It became obvious in the mid-1980s that we were building models of basic processes and models of instructional practice on a whole new theoretical infrastructure. Schema theory, the centrality of the knowledge comprehension relationship. So, I have the same question. Just yeah. what is schema theory? What is schema theory? What is, theory? What is, theory? What is the knowledge comprehension? Well, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, schema yeah. theory. Yeah. So here we're looking at, yeah, at discipline-specific terms, right, and terminology that's not familiar to the students. So at this point, I would have said, um, does anyone know what schema theory is? Can anyone define that in the group? Look at Teresa, because I know she's got to put an education. OK, well, schema theory is the idea that you know everyone has an idea of how the world works and of what happens. So you have a schema for a fast food restaurant. You have a schema for a fancy restaurant. You have a schema for a classroom. You have a different schema for a phys ed classroom than you would have for a lecture style classroom. Right? So schemas are kind of your models of what happens. And schema theory works on the, on, on the idea that whatever schemas kids have in their heads um, are going to affect how they learn and the ways we teach. So there's schemas for classroom practices that, that are operating as we do this. Anyone know the centrality of knowledge comprehension relationship? What's that? Awesome. It's my understanding, I read that and sort of thought that that theory is central to you know, pretty much what you just said, it's central to how uh, students understand what they're reading. Exactly. So the knowledge you bring to a text feeds into your understanding of the text. And if you and I bring different types of information to a text, we may end up understanding that text in different ways. So, yeah. So knowledge and confidence, what you bring, your prior knowledge, is going to affect how you make sense of that text. So if we look so far at what we've read, we've talked about these new formats that did not take root, and that these models of instructional practice, these new, a new theoretical infrastructure that includes this focus on meaning and how you make sense of things, is playing into our understanding of how you make sense of text. Okay, Andrew. Okay, in the middle of the sentence here. While our assessments had not changed since the infusion of criteria and reference tests beginning in the early stop. Criteria and reference tests. <laughs> a lot of vocabulary in here, isn't there? Yeah, criteria and reference tests are just tests that say you need to perform at this criteria. So there's criteria for different levels. So if you think about the testing that's being done in South Carolina right now, and the idea that reads to succeed, that third graders have to read a particular level or they get retained, that's a criteria reference test. So there's criteria that you have to If you think about the ACT test, there's a criteria you have to meet if you want to get into the University of South Carolina. So it's just the idea that any test is going to reference particular criteria. Okay, and here they're saying that um, our assessments have not changed since the infusion of criteria and reference tests in the 1970s. So we're still testing kids in the old way and say you got to get this score or this grade with this criteria. I also had a little note. Um, I just put off to the side that building new models of teaching with, but still assessing the input. And that'll lead perfectly into the next sentence or two. Unfortunately, the notion of two steps forward, three steps back was only too real, and it exposed the political nature of reform and change. Only a century before H.G. Wells had remarked, the examiner pipes and the teacher must dance, and the examiner sticks to the old two. Stop. An amazing analogy, isn't it? The piper and the dancer. So sometimes I throw in my ideas. Carry on, Andrew. <laughs> uh, hold on. If the educational reformers really wish the dance altered, they must turn their attention from the dancers to the musicians. Stop. I, heard, I thought that was cool. Um, <laughs> oh, Kenny uh, thinks it's cool. Yeah, because you change, you have to go to the root of the problem. Yes. So yes. That's very apparent. Uh, yeah. Just uh, I'm in the school of public health, mm -hmm. so 
something they often talk about is moving upstream. So it's the story about like people drowning in a river. Instead of just constantly saving the people that are drowning, you go upstream and find out why they're drowning. We do the same thing in the business school because if a business is something's wrong, you just blame the person and you see what's, what's the underlying issue. And do you see what you two are doing? You're connecting this argument to your prior knowledge, which is the way we make sense of text. Jacob. Well, it's a great metaphor. It's a great figure, you know. I mean, I can understand that from, you know, from reading, you know, literary works and, you know, like, um, I really think it's very effective. Yes, yes. And, and, and you know, this, this uh, again, you're, you're tapping into your discipline to make sense of this text, which is absolutely the way we do it. But metaphor is actually a very powerful device because metaphors, especially this one, is using a river. We all know what a river is, right? So our, our dance that we're using to dance, the musicians, which we all know what they are. So it's, it's a useful metaphor because it cuts across our disciplinary knowledge to help us see things through a particular lens. Right? So metaphors can be powerful things for our students as well, drawing their attention to it, seeing metaphorical um, meanings as, as useful is something they might not always walk through the door. Any other thoughts before we move to this paragraph? Okay, Andrew. hundred years later, we are still okay. learning the steps to the same dance. By the mid-1990s, the field of reading comprehension assessment had shifted its stance once again, taking a couple steps back to accommodate political pressures. So, so I just um, add a question about whether it's like national or state pressures. Um, let's read out the context for that just yet. In the 1990s, it would have probably been more state pressure because the national initiatives have been uh, starting around the year 2000. So there has been a shift. More recently, it's been more national pressure around education, educational standards that are implemented by the state. But in the past, the states had more autonomy over how education operates. Because of a conservative backlash, psychometric suspicion about uh, what, what is psychometric? <laughs> <laughs> measurement. Measurement of children's reading, so testing and measurement. Okay. Okay, I got it. Okay. Oh, like, I was going to ask for the conservative backlash part. I put education and politics and the question mark less funding. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's been, you know, this is not the place to go into this whole discussion. So sometimes I just give throw the ball for something different, right? But this whole uh, testing mantra, this emphasis on psychometric data, um, and the idea that. Um, you know, th these policy issues are, are coming into play, are important things to just keep on your radar as you move through your education courses. So just giving them kind of a, it's coming, you'll hear more about this. <laughs> okay, so this is a long sentence, so I'll start from the beginning because of the conservative backlash, psychometric suspicions about new forms of assessments, utility issues to new approaches took too long or too expensive and difficult to score, and equity concerns will minority students do in better or will they in fact do worse on the, those short, sorts of measures. Adjustments were made to assessment systems that relied mainly on longer text and more complex and more open formats. Stop. Okay. And here they're alluding to the idea that I could sit you down and give you a multiple choice test and you will be done with it in 15 minutes and I could score it in a minute and a half. Right? So all I need to do is plug it into my computer and I get the scores. If I give you a test that requires you to go online, research a topic, write an essay, right? And to construct an argument where you're going to argue for a particular stance, A, that's going to take you a lot longer to do. And B, it's going to take me a lot longer to score because I can't just plug it into a, a, a testing uh, scoring machine, right? I had, so, so here, We've got this issue where we want to do high quality assessments that really get at how well you understand something. It's going to take more time on both of our parts. Andrew. Players from both sides of the political aisle use one. This sort of like the question you brought up earlier of is this, yeah, state, what, what level is this? Yeah. Which. Yeah. And, and I didn't mention before, but there's also another dimension here is you have federal initiatives implemented by the states, implemented by the district, implemented by the schools. So you have at least four levels to how this stuff is coming down. So the politics kind of spans various agencies. 
And you will find that if you're in two different schools in South Carolina, the assessment program might be very different because of the ways that you're implementing the um, mandates that are coming from downtown. And students need to understand that because they're going to go out to different schools to do their same teaching and their teaching. So I'm thinking about all the things that are going on. To attack and eliminate assessments such as class stop, what is class? Yeah, I yes. <laughs> and I actually had to look up class before I came today. It's a California uh, literacy assessment system that was put into place a few years back, and it was what we call a performance exam. So remember I was saying a few minutes ago about how you could give them a task where they had to go online and find some resources and write an essay, and then had to be scored by humans because machines couldn't do it. That's kind of assessment class once. So it's very progressive, but it actually became also problematic, not only for the time it took, but if you read the next sentence, we'll get to the next issue. It is interesting to note that in the wake of CLEPS's demise, already validated at great state expense of professional involvement, performance assessments in states such as Indiana and Wisconsin were shelved without seeing the light of day. Yeah. So it never really got implemented because um, they implemented it for a very short time. There were similar ones being implemented in Indiana and Wisconsin, and those never came to be. I had a little note uh, mm -hmm. at the end there too, uh, just kind of tying back to the metaphor up the top. I said that they're, they were trying to reform the assessment and in doing so they missed the music change. Yep, yep, they're trying to destroy yeah. that. Interesting, because the two are so intertwined. Okay, any other thoughts on this before I ask you to? Okay. So you, you understand the piece. How many of you understand it better now than you did when you read it on your own? Okay, okay so this is, this is one of the things that I do in class and that, and that uh, literacy educators do um, in general is to really give them something that's a little challenging, but sample them through it and allow it to be a conversation about the text that they're reading. So I suspect all of you can think of something that you teach that is really complicated and the students always have a hard time with it, but you could give them a couple of paragraphs and have them walk through and have this kind of collaborative, um, it's a collaborative comprehension, it's a collaborative understanding. I want you right now to think about something in your discipline that this might be useful for, so some construct that's hard for your students to get. I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to think of something. What's it that messes them up every single time? If you were high school math, it'd be word problems. Yeah. <laughs> Adele, do you have an idea? No. No? Teresa? No, I'm just thinking. I was trying to know what you were saying. Okay, I'll come back to you guys. Do you have anything in medicine that's hard for them? No? Oh, yeah, quite a bit. I mean, I mostly work with numbers in the data lab, but a lot of the stuff that what the question is asking them it's all on a computer it'll say in the problem is i don't know anyone here like statistics a lot but a lot of the terminology and statistics is so bad it, it's it's nobody's fault but it's like if you're a person every year trying to learn it you see like hypothesis you think of fourth grade science but it's completely different in college so trying to get that across is difficult and then when you actually run the numbers through the machines or the programs that we use, you get a bunch of numbers on the grid. How do you actually interpret that? What's the number we're looking for? So even though they're not reading words, they have to look at a visual of text mm -hmm. and find and pick the pieces that they actually need. And you can have them annotate a visual. Oh, yeah. And then just talk about the diagram, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, we can just say, go from left to right or top to bottom or whatever would be a way to make sense of that. It really is in, in, the, in the world of what we do is hate wasting time. Business is hate wasting time. You want to do things fast and with as many short as possible. So when you get a huge report and you're freaking out, dart your eyes to ear, ear, and ear. These are the three things you're looking for. This number right here, that's your answer. They ignore everything else. That's what's helpful. So. Yeah. yeah, they need to help. Your help to kind of decode. Mm -hmm. so. any, any areas in your discipline? Yeah, um, it's just. TA for like uh, the interest anthropology, mm -hmm. you know, sort of intro uh, cultural anthropology, the way the professor's set up, which I might not agree with, it is very theory heavy and it's going on very from the history. So we read a lot of like a lot of older stuff that's very verbose. That means that even at, for me, I'm doing a, a higher level class, it's almost very inadequate going to history, reading German, reading Marx, 
Um, and I argue there's a lot of stuff that's, that, and especially for the students, they don't need to know all of it. There's, you've got to sift through a lot. There's one or two kernels they really need to pull out for their understanding. But you get, the same with me, you get lost in the weeds, is the one part, and just the, the vernacular. Yeah, Edward Said, we read recently, they really they struggle with that. Yeah. Super interesting stuff, but he also, he's just, some of them too are, they're so careful about how they define terms, so they spend pages just kind of like narrowing it down. Yeah, so it's sifting through the weeds is the, the challenge for myself. Yeah. And for some of that, those pieces, especially with my doctoral students who, you know, sometimes are, are just entering into this and having to read some of this really heavy stuff. I might choose just a paragraph out of those. And, you know, the one that, the, like the kernel. Yeah. You know, just do the kernel together, and then when they go up to read the other stuff themselves, it seems to help them more. So I do computer geography, but I TA in environmental studies. So I find that they're very comfortable in natural sciences. But we did um, an article on... Um, a, like an argument against the Anthropocene that was very social science heavy, and I was into it. I was like, yes. Um, but they had trouble like deciphering the like nuances of the article. Um, like, because I think with natural sciences, you can kind of do like a quick read. Like, you, but like with some of these more social science, you really have to get into it. And you have to be like, oh, they're against the Anthropocene because humans aren't a homogenous group. And so I kept having to do that, or like explain Marx to them, and they were just like. We like the natural sciences. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little overwhelming. Yeah. For sure. So you like pull out a couple of key sections. Yeah. Just like a couple sentences of like, all right, this is really like what they're arguing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Get get rid of all the black, like you said, kind of. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Liu, anything in particular that comes to mind that's tricky for your students? Like, I, I can't. Yeah. I see, I can understand this well, so, yeah, there are a lot to, to know about this, yeah. A lot of background. Yeah, a lot of background knowledge, yeah. Jacob, what kinds of things are hard for your students? They seem to have a lot of trouble writing conclusions. Uh -huh. the, the, the conclusion of the essay seems to give yeah. a lot of them trouble, you know. Uh -huh. They can, um, oftentimes, um, compose a thesis and, you know, understand how they're supposed to support the thesis. But then when they get to the end, they just want to move out. You know, yes, and, they're so, tired. You know, <laughs> There's that stamina coming much. in again. <laughs> yeah, but it's tricky. Yeah. And then one of the ways to get around that a little bit or to help them to be able to write a conclusion is to um, spend some time doing this kind of work with good conclusions. Oh, yes. And show them some of the things that people do as well. Oh, that's and great. really pull things together. Okay. I would say one thing my students struggle with is uh, drawing conclusions and connecting dots. I know it was talk, like we were talking about yeah, lost in the weeds. Um, in anatomy, the way we go about teaching it is like system by system, like cardiovascular system, respiratory, nervous system. But in all that information, how do they all come together to give life? And then that's, you know, that's part of, you know, in order to teach things, we break things into their pieces, and then we want them to put it back together. So it, it, sometimes that's a little bit of a, a challenge. Anything comes to mind that's hard for your students? The, the honesty was resonate with me is, I think for a lot of folks, if you came up as a, I'll use term, good reader, you don't think about what we just did. I mean, you just say, oh, we'll just read it. And I had some understanding from the two paragraphs, but even as somebody who thinks of themselves as a decent reader, um, I definitely, from hearing the thoughts and stopping, it made me draw some connections that I had not thought of initially. But then I also, what's kicking around my head right now, is how powerful this would be to get adults to actually take the time to do this. Because I work primarily right now with adults all the time, yeah. um, and they're all educated. And that, I mean, that's good. Mm -hmm. But the power of just taking two paragraphs and just taking a few minutes to go through this, uh, I just think would be powerful. Yeah. And then I think one of the things that we face with our undergrads, but also with adults, and particularly adults who might not be um, accomplished in school all the time, who so may have had mixed 
backgrounds in schooling, or our undergraduates that get to college and all of a sudden it's hard. For them it's been easy, 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 easy. They've always done just fine in their courses and all of a sudden they get to college and they get a college level course and they have to actually do the work and they actually have to do the readings. And you know, sometimes that wasn't always an expectation in high school. So that you find them just scrambling to try and get it all done. But I, I think one of the things we had to do is to let them understand that we're all learning to read and that they're all, you know, moving towards this process and that, um, you know, you were saying about, you know, they think that they think you're either a good reader or you're not a good reader. And that if this text is hard for me, I must be a bad reader. And there's something wrong with me or I don't belong in college or whatever that message is that they're starting to internalize. And that's not at all true because doing the things that we were doing are what, we all do what good readers do, but are often unaware of it, right? So we ask ourselves questions as we read, or we ask the author questions, or we argue with the question, we talk back to the text, we say, oh, I disagree with this, I don't like this, this guy's wrong, this guy's an idiot, right? But we have conversations with the text as we read. We read, and we reread, and we reread, especially if it's hard text. People think that if you're a good reader, you never have to reread, you did everything the first time. That's not true. <laughs> Even us college professors have to go back and reread things multiple times sometimes. And sometimes it's because they're older texts and they're convoluted. Like reading Saeed? I mean, come on. How many of us can read it just through and then explain it to someone? You know, we're going down with a fine tooth comb. We're drawing lines and making marks and taking notes. And, you know, when I'm reading something that's like outside of my wheelhouse, I write notes on everything I read if it's heavy and theoretical because I have to do that in order to understand it. If I just read it, it goes in and out. It, it doesn't, I, I can't use it. I can't use it in my own writing. I can't use it in my own scholarship. So, um, you know, we read and we reread. We take notes, we draw diagrams, we write in margins, and we read aloud in the tough sections. When you get to a part of a reading that's really hard to read, if you whisper read it and you hear yourself enunciating the words, it's often easier to understand. And that's a tool that our undergraduates can take away with them too. Is if you get to a tough part, you know, just read it quietly to yourself. And just hearing it will help you to process the information. Because then you've got two modalities going on. You've got the reading it and you've got the hearing it. And those are the two things that we can. So, you know, getting away from that idea that you're a good reader or a bad reader because students often feel that people who do these things are not good readers. So if you do these things, you're not a good reader? Wrong. If you do those things, you are a good reader. And they're reluctant, they're cautious, they're reticent, they don't want anyone to think they're not a perfect reader. And none of us are. So kind of taking down that, I find that talking to them about reading is really helpful. And making that something. We know they're still learning to read in college. So we already did this. And close reading is something you can do um, before they have readings to do. You can do it in class with something that you didn't even assign to them outside of class, just something you want to work on with them in class. Or you can do it for a reading that's coming up. So we might do a close reading and then send them home to this article the next day. Okay. So moving into genre studies. When I'm teaching education courses, there's a bunch of genres that they need. It's all in the discipline of education. There's lots of different kinds of texts they read. So sometimes we do pedagogical readings. And these are just examples from education, but I'm going to ask you to think about your own examples in a minute. So in education, we read readings that tell them how to teach, or that describe scenarios of teachers teaching, or, or talk about what happens in a classroom, ethical pedagogies that they're working on. We have empirical research articles. That's when people go out and do research, and they have a lit review, and they have a theoretical framework, and then they talk about their methodology, and then they report their findings. So these are actual empirical studies that um, we have in education. We have teacher narratives, where teachers write about their own practices. So you have a little story of a teacher in a classroom from her perspective or his perspective. We have policy documents that come from state ed that they have to read. We have curricular documents that often come from school districts that tell you what you're supposed to be teaching. We have educational standards, which are either national or um, state level, and they have to read those and understand those. And we have lesson plans. They read other people's lesson plans, they have to learn those. So these are the different kinds of texts that we encounter in education. 
but that's going to be different for um, you folks as well. In a minute, like I said, I'm going to have you think about the different kinds of texts that operate in your world. This is what I do with my doctoral students. Because my doctoral students have to understand what kind of text they're reading really carefully. Because when they go to write their dissertation, they're going to have to write a literature review. And they're going to have to write a position paper. And they're going to have to write, create an empirical study and talk about their methodology and all that. So when I'm doing doctoral work, I'm very careful to have them understand what kind of text they're reading because they're going to have to write it because they're going to be um, you know, doing actual scholarship. So I throw that in there. I know that most of our undergraduates don't need this level of understanding, but I think that's really important. But what I do want you to do is to flip your paper over or find a spot to write and list out the different kinds of readings that your students do. And the different kinds of articles, the different kinds of papers. And if you're doing a textbook, so how many of you use textbooks in your classes? Okay, textbooks can be the worst things on earth to read, right? They're just not very exciting, right? They're full of facts. But textbooks also have different segments in them. Within a textbook, there may be sections that are narrative where they tell a story. There may be sections that give them instructions on how to do something, like do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. There might be diagrams, there might be charts. So even within a textbook, there's different kinds of texts. So right now, make a list of all different kinds of texts that your students read over the course of the semester. Which of the texts are most challenging, and why? Case studies. Case study, why? The language. We do a lot of Harvard business review. And undergrads, and they're very interesting, but like if it's talking about an industry or a company that you don't really know or care about, it's really hard to like invest. And you learn a lot by getting getting over that hill. Uh -huh. can be a you know, that is so hilarious because in education, case studies are one of the easiest things to read because they're generally a story of a child. I mean, when you're when you're talking about a child as a case study. That, that, you, know, you can connect to that kid and you feel committed to them. Whereas your case studies, there, there's so much context, so much understanding that goes with these very complicated scenarios. Yeah, and really at the end of the day, is it are they going to make money or not? And again, a business school that is important. But again, like if you're reading a case study about like Uber or like the story of Apple, that's interesting, you know. But if, if you're doing a steel company in the 1970s, <laughs> how should they modernize their factory? We're not in the 70s. Anymore. I mean, it's a good example historically, right, but right. it's not exciting, so. What else? What else is hard for students? And this might be seen as a case study. I put peer-reviewed research mm -hmm. along the same lines. Yeah. And peer-reviewed research can be qualitative. It can be very story-esque. Or it can be quantitative, where you're looking at results and, um, you know, uh, stainines and um, uh, Charts and spreadsheets and all that. Thank you, yes, yes. And, and statistical significance and all those variables and all that. That stuff can be really hard to read, right? That's out of my wheelhouse. That would be hard to read. Sure. <laughs> what else? Yeah, okay. a lot of professors um, like to choose just chapters from a book, and so it's hard when it's like qualitative, like ethnographic research, and you have to hope that they'll get what the, the person is saying in that chapter without the rest of the book. <laughs> yes, yes, so <laughs> excerpts. Yeah. Yes, in, in English literature classes, they often would do this. They'll pull an excerpt from something, especially on tests. They love to pull an <laughs> excerpt on a test which is kind of bizarre when you think about it because you're asking kids to comprehend and you're only giving them a piece of the text, which isn't quite there. So yeah, so you know, where is this coming from? Sometimes even quotes that authors will use, they'll put a quote in from another author, and depending on how well they contextualize that quote, they can feel um, disruptive or, or start up, startling, takes you away from the argument you're trying to read. So bad writing is another thing that makes it really hard to read, right? Mm -hmm. uh, peer reviews, the peer review of the essays. Sometimes my students have trouble with that because the essays that they're asked to review are written by other students who did do a very good job. You know? So they read each other's essays. Oh yeah, they have a rubric that they have to go by, but uh -huh. still, uh -huh. I mean, if the essay they're asked to read, to review, 
is really poor, <laughs> then uh, that, that's hard for them. Yeah, it's hard for me. I've read a lot of dissertations. <laughs> they're not all, first time through, they're not all that good. Usually by the time we're done, we got them. But the first time through, it can be really hard. Any other, other examples? Yeah, I would just say, like, the, again, sort of what I mentioned, like, Saeed, the uh, theoretical stuff, like Foucault and Lacan, some of these stuff where it's, it's not always as tangible. They're, like, they're positing these great ideas. And even for myself in my seminar courses, you just like, yeah. why are you talking about? And one of the things I often do for those is there's people who have written, like, eight-page overviews of Foucault. So, yeah. and, and Wiki is, I should mention Wikipedia, <laughs> but you know, sometimes reading the Wikipedia page, you tell them don't trust everything you read, but it sets them up enough to be able to go back and read the piece and get some of the big ideas. So I am not adverse to giving them you know, a simplified version to help them to make an entree to the more complicated one, but then you want to work with some of the ideas in the more complicated one so that you, they're not just walking away with the Wiki version. But I think um, you know there, there's ways to use these tools in the service of reading instruction because it's almost like telling you you're reading about laundry. You know, it's giving you a sense of what you're reading about, and then when you go back and read it, you can read it. Okay. So common challenges: vocabulary, complicated concepts, that particular genre, the length and stamina, establishing a framework for understanding. I think that's what I was just saying with the Wikipedia kind of thing, and accommodating new information. So sometimes one of the things that makes things hard to read is we have very strong beliefs. And when we read other beliefs, sometimes it's very hard for us to take those ideas serious or to challenge our own thinking. We find this sometimes in South Carolina because some of our students are from very rural communities and they haven't grappled with issues around diversity, which are really important in education because my teachers are going to go out and teach everybody. So they need to understand a little bit about historic racism in the United States. They need to understand you know, why some communities may um, have more resources than others, why some schools are funded in different ways than others. All of these things are going to impact their lives. And they need to be able to make sense of those things. So sometimes when we read work, uh, pieces on social justice or critical race theory, we have a real hard time with those pieces because they're, they're, they're challenging some very deeply held beliefs that they're bringing to the classroom that as educators we, we need to disrupt. And sometimes it's not always a pleasant experience to have your beliefs disrupted. So that's another place where we have challenges. So these are the generic kinds of text structures that we often see in nonfiction texts and informational texts. Um, Nate, how long do I have? Uh, about two minutes. Oh, two minutes? OK. <laughs> so just, just to give you an idea, texts are structured different ways. And sometimes they're descriptive. Sometimes they have a sequence, like a historical piece, where you read this happened, and then this, and then this, and then this. Sometimes it's compare and contrast. They'll have two different examples, and they ask you to compare them. Sometimes it's cause and effect. And sometimes it's a problem, and then the solution. So these different text structures, what we want to do is to make kids aware of what the structure is. So when you assign a reading, you might say that this is a compare and contrast. They're going to give two different examples, and then look across those. You might say to them, this is more cause and effect. They're going to tell you about a problem, and then they're going to tell you about the effect of that problem and some possible solution. So these are um, different ways that informational texts are set up, and we can give them a heads up to those. So these are some, uh, OK. So one last example, just to give you something to walk away with. And this is something, so I assign you know, three or four readings for every class. And then they come back and they read them. But I ask them every week to bring me 500 words. And in that 500 words, they don't have to write about all three readings. But I want them to write about the ideas that were most salient to them, the things that really struck them, or the things that they disagree with, or the things that they want to talk about in class. So I just ask them to read 500 words. I take their 500 words in class, I read them. And, and every day, every time we get back together for class, I identify, oh, this paragraph is interesting that this person wrote. And these two sentences were really interesting. 
and then this student had a very different opinion, and I think it's something I should put in front of the class. So I choose, you know, just a few hundred words from across the papers, and I actually read parts of their thought papers aloud to the class. Because it does two things. One is, they have to give me something to show that they read, and to show that they were thinking about what they read. And two is it allows me to take the conversation we had last week and build it in, into our class this week. So it creates this continuity of ideas. So last week we might have read about an identity construct, construct related to education. And next week we're going to extend that conversation. I can quote from their papers to bring us forward into that next conversation. Or I can cycle back to something that I wanted to um, talk more about. Or maybe they have this great insight, and they're that student who just never says anything in class. This gives me a chance to put their voice on it. So this is another way of, of getting them to work through ideas. So I'm just going to flip through. This is my email. If there's ever anything I can do for you, I'm very happy to. But again, thank you for coming and spending time with us today.